We are the watchmen of this city. We are the people who should be praying for the city. And if the world is looking and saying, Boston, things are going wrong. It is because you, whom God has ordained as a watchman, you are not doing your duty. You are not praying. The children challenge that. Jesus started with the prayers. And ended with prayers. And he was the son of God. Boston, we need to wake up. Sister Faith in Worcester, you need to wake up. Sister Sarah in Worcester, we need to wake up in prayer. We need to rise up the banner in our city that Boston belongs to Jesus. Boston is a city of God. Boston is a, is a city where people can know God and walk after God and follow God and follow the decrees of the world. We are the watchmen. And if you can let the devil in, I am telling you, even our children are going to be sacked in the system. It's so unfortunate. We need to rise up. And the only way we rise up is when we avail ourselves in the presence of God. It is only God who can deal with these issues. May God help us. Amen? I would like to take this opportunity and tell you to walk up to Christ is the answer church. Christ is the answer church is a Bible-believing church and we thank God for you. Can we put our hands together for the visitors who are visiting with us? <laughs> Pastor Sarah, we love you. Amen. Uh, we are about to hear the word of God. And I know time is far gone, Bishop. I know the Lord will help you. Amen. To share with, with us what you have in your spirit. Uh, tonight or this afternoon, we've got the man of God, uh, Bishop Chege, Stephen. I've known this man those days that w when we were in Kenya and uh, even before he got his wife. We used to be friends. We served in the same ministry. And I thank God that the man of God is still serving in Africa, Kenya. So could you please help me to welcome this great man of God, Bishop Stephen Chere, to the pulpit to come and share with us. Amen, amen. And we appreciate God for the man of God in the house tonight. God bless you, Bishop. Nice having you with you. Uh, my name's are Bishop Stephen Chege, and uh, I love the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal savior. I gave my life to Jesus 27 years ago. And the Lord has been so good to my life. I have committed my life uh, totally in him. And I have purpose in my life that I will serve him the, the rest of my life. Because I know there is all the benefits in serving the Lord. I am married to one wife. And uh, we are blessed with three young men. And uh, the Lord has blessed us, and we want to thank the Lord. This morning, I was preaching to Kenya in our service in the evening, and I was given greetings. Receive greetings from Kenya in Jesus' name. So, uh, I am here for one week, then I go back to Kenya. I'll be going back to Kenya on uh, 8th uh, next Monday. And uh, today, I am so honored and greatly privileged to be in this very altar, I want to acknowledge my sincere thanks to Pastor John Wachira, whom we have served from our youthhood. And uh, Pastor Joan, uh, I came to know her uh, through uh, uh, Wachira, uh, Reverend, and uh, I am so delighted. One thing that I have to state in this uh, uh, very altar is that you are blessed to have a servant, servants of God, that fear sin. You know, that's the first thing. Servants of the Lord that they fear sin. You know, they, they, don't, they don't want to associate themselves with sin. We have so many servants of God in the world today, but they sometimes associate with sin. One thing that I love with Leverage uh, Wachila and I, the, the wife is that they hate sin with a passion. Now that will make me feel I need to associate with them because this is my calling. And now, God has called me in my ministry to speak the word of God without compromise and without fear and without intimidation. I will not allow any, anything to intimidate me because I left my secular job, which was well paying, so that I can enter into this field of building the kingdom of God. I am not ashamed, like Paul said, about the gospel of Jesus because I have seen benefits in this kingdom. 
I have seen mighty, mighty benefits in this kingdom. And so I don't regret uh, being in this kingdom. Okay. In the, in the house of God, we are gifted differently. And every time a minister of the word of God comes here to minister the word, I want you to ask you in Jesus' name, open up your heart. And let your heart be so big to receive. Receive from the Lord through the servants. We were not called or we, we were not orators. We were not even called to stand before people. Some of us could not stand before people those days. I remember when I got saved, I was told to give a testimony. I just gave two words and sit down. But let me tell you, as time went by, God gave us and granted us the ability to speak the word of God, to speak the power of God to the people and to the world. And so here I am telling you, I know there are people here, some years to come, there will be great men and women of God. If you open your heart, if you become somebody that opens the heart for God. I, I like going deep to the scriptures and reading verse by verse because every word that is written in this book is variable. It is powerful. It can change somebody. It can bring a difference in the life of somebody. And that is why when I speak the word of God, I like going verse by verse and I ask the Lord by his spirit to speak to me personally before I speak to people. And so, allow me, if I preach the way you, you are not used to, please allow me, because this is the spirit of God, and the spirit of God is the spirit of diversity. He can use us differently, but to build his kingdom. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter. Luke chapter Seven. I will try to spend my time uh, very wisely and I believe by the time that I, I, I live here we, we have gone through what God has ordained for us today Luke chapter 7 we are going to read from verse 1 we, are, we have the, our, our message today we will go through only to 10 verses and we are done but we have to go verse by verse because I believe the Lord is going to speak to us. I will say, when Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered cup now. So let's go to verse 2. That was, that's where we begin. The Bible is talking about one man. And this man was a centurion. He was a great, high, a great uh, uh, officer. He was a man of high rank in commanding soldiers and he was a big man. He was like a general. And this man, the Bible says something in verse 2. There was a centurion servant whom his servants, his master valued highly and was sick and was about to die. We are going to settle there for a, bit, for a minute. So the first thing that we, we see, this man was a, a great Officer, he was a man of high esteem, a man who could be respected. So like a general in Kenya, the one who commands all the armies. And now this man, the word of God is telling us that he had a servant. He had a, a servant. And this servant, the word of God stated categorical there, that he, the, the master valued the servant. He valued the servant. Now, when I look at the word value, I see something very powerful there. You see, when you value somebody or you value something, you take care of it. You, you safeguard it from any attack. And now here, okay, the, the message, the, the, the heading of the message is faith that marvels Jesus. That's what I'm going to talk about. Faith that marvels Jesus. Now, when you value something, you take care of it. You protect it. You safeguard it. And now the Bible tells me that this man valued this servant. Two things I see. The servant was the boss, of course. And no, the, the, the centurion was the boss. And the servant was the subject. One thing I see between these two is that there was a relationship. 
there was a healthy relationship. There was an excellent communion between the two. And that is, I, I, when I look at the servant, I see a submissive servant. I see an obedient servant. I see somebody who was, when the, when, when the boss said do, he never used to say no. He was obedient. And that is why he was valued by the boss. Yes. Now, you can never have a healthy relationship between your boss. I know you are employed. Or you, you are a boss somewhere. You can never value your boss. Or your servant can never value the boss. If there is no healthy relationship. So today, I am here to tell you that there is, when you are a master, you need to cultivate a good relationship with you are, you are subordinate. You are subject. And you, if you are here and you are a servant, you need to cultivate a good relationship with your boss. That is godly. So, the one of God says that they had, the, 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 the centurion valued this, uh, this servant. But unfortunate is that this servant was sick. He was sick. Now, that's a point, point number two. Was sick. You can be sick, but that sick is maybe, it's not a big sickness. Today, my, I talked with my brother and told me, you did not see me, see me last week because I had a flu, a flu, flu, or a cold. That is a sickness. But maybe this is not a, a sickness that can really, really, you know, be, you can really not say this is a really big uh, sickness that can hit you from doing your daily program. So this servant was sick. But now, the one of God says, but, and this was about to die. So the life of this servant was about to go. The life of this servant was air being away. And so now I see a servant and a centurion here. They had good relationship. But now the centurion is here also bothered. Because the relationship is about to go. Because this is about to die. She, he is about to go. Now, when I was reading that verse, the Lord gave me something. And I asked myself, what is my relationship with my people? I have employed people. I have, I have, in, our, in our ministry, we have teachers, we have pastors, and we, we, we work together. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, help me to cultivate a good relationship with the people that I work with. To, to, to have a harmonious relationship. That I can be touched by the, the need of that person. That I can be touched by what he is going through. Amen. And this man was touched by the circumstances that surrounded the, the, this, the, this servant. And the word of God says something in verse 3. Let's continue. There was something that was so good. The areas of the centurion. And remember he was a Roman he was from a Roman ranking officer. He was not from, from the Jews. He was not a Jew. I, that's the first thing I want you to get and underline and put it behind your mind. This, man, this was just a Roman centurion. But he had heard about Jesus. He had heard of what Jesus was doing. And so he heard that there is a Jesus who is healing. And so he decided to to do something. He decided to do something for the servant. And so he went to the elders. Of the Jews. And he told them please. I beseech you. Let's read that. The centurion had the, the Jesus. The heart of Jesus. And he sent some elders of the Jews. To him. Ask him. Come and heal his servants. Praise the Lord. How are you moved? Are you moved? When you hear somebody has a problem, when somebody has a circumstance that is pressing that person, how are you moved? Some of us, when we get, maybe somebody has a problem, we don't even, we say, okay, God will help him. And that's all. We, we, we think nothing to help that person. But here now we see something. That he went to an extent of seeking, sorry, seeking help from Jesus. Who performed miracles? And so he told the, 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 the elders, just go. Just go and ask Jesus to come. Verse 4. Let's continue. The Bible says, when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly. I want you to, to get that word. They pleaded 
earnestly, underline the word they pleaded, that statement. They pleaded earnestly with him. Now, if they had no good relationship, if they had no fellowship, he could not have even, you know, they could not have even pleaded. Because they saw the centurion. And remember, he was not a, a, a Jew. He was not from the nation. They, they were, he was a Roman. But these are Jews. But now we see the Jews, the, the elders, asking Jesus. Asking Jesus. Honestly. Pleading honestly. When you see somebody putting emphasis on something, there is something that is behind. Yeah. They, he, you cannot just plead. Oh, help. Help. Him. Without having some benefits. Let me tell you, people of God, it is imperative for all of us to receive this word because this is a word for you today. Uh -huh. Here we see these people. You see, look at that, the second verse, the one in quotes. He said, this man deserves to have you do this. This man deserves. In King James Version, it says, this man is worth it. That he was worthy for whom he should do this. The word, the two words, two pregnant words there. Deserve. Worthy. I want to tell you today, when you do things, when you do things that will speak about yourself, you don't need anybody to speak for yourself. You don't need to speak to, to, to yourself. You, people will speak about you. When you do acts that speaks, you don't need to stand and start talking and bragging about yourself. People will speak about you. People will plead for on your behalf. These Jews, they went. But I was asking myself, why did they say he is worth of this? Let's move on. One, two, you know, we are going word by word because I want you to, to get this very powerfully. For one, he loved our nation. Amen. Now, remember, the, the key word there is love. You know, love is powerful. There is no powerful word. The word of God says, God is love. So when you have love, it is powerful. Amen. And that is what was pushing them before Jesus. If you love, you have genuine love because we have what we call counterfeit love. We have fake love. And as young men, let me, let me begin there from with there. If you, you are young, a young man here and somebody tells you that I love you. I love you. And I, eh. One guy from Muranga wanted to cheat, to cheat a girl. He saw a beautiful girl and he, he decided to cheat. And you know what he said? So and so, I don't want to mention the name. So and so, he might be here, you never know. So and so, I love you so much that when I think about you, when I think about you, my heart freaks. Freaks is like it, it freezes. Freaks. So they meet every time, you know, he wants to cheat the girl. And when the girl here, my heart fresh. Even her heart fresh. And she doesn't know that she's been cheated. I want you to, 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 to be careful. Be vigilant. Be a person who is vigilant. As I said on Friday, produce your areas. Even when somebody tells you he loves you, it should not be just love. Love must be with an action. Love must be demonstrated. When, somebody, when, a, when a young man keeps on telling you, I love you, I love you, and you can never take him or take her for a dinner. Just $10. You cannot take her in a Chinese restaurant. Just $10. That, uh, when, even when he is producing, it's like he is feeling so hard to give. You better be careful. True love has sacrifice. True love has sacrifice. So this man loved the nation of Israel. And that is what compelled these elders to, to, to honestly seek help. Now listen. He did something. What 
did he do? Let's see. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Who, what is a synagogue? It's a place of worship. It's a place of, of worship. Let me tell you, people of God. When I think about this centurion, I try to compare the centurion with the present church. I ask myself, this centurion never knew God. He was a Gentile, but he, his love was so much compared to do something in the house of God. We have people in the house of God here. And I ask myself, in my history, my history is not many years, but I have not seen one man in the church saying, now forget this project, I will do it alone. I will build the church alone for God. I have not seen. This man was not spirit filled. The centurion, he was a Gentile, but he valued God. He valued God, the God of the Jews, to an extent of doing an action. Today, we have to soothe you to give you a 10%. Many verses must be read. As if you don't, you don't understand. As if you are a kid. I'm not abusing you. I'm also there. So many verses can be put here as if you have never seen it. You get your money at the end of the week. God requires only a tenth. A tenth of it. You get $400 or $700 a week. God has given you the power. God has given you the strength. God has given you the good health. You get to enable you to work 24-7 without sickness. But when God tells you 10% belong to me, you hold it. But you still say, I love the Lord. When we are here, we are lifting our hands up and saying, Hallelujah. And I like the way he said, when God looks from above, people raising hands, but disobedient people, they cannot even bring the tithe to the house. They see it offers. He see it offers. Have you said, it's like meeting robbers after they have stolen <laughs> in their church, thanking the Lord. And worshiping the Lord we have stolen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and you know there is a difference between stealing and robbery. Stealing is whereby you do it silently. I, I, I better even be, be called, uh, told I have, been, I have stolen. Because it's like it's a big pot pocket in Kawangwale or <laughs> in Nairobi city or River Road. Because that one ha has no harm. But a robber will give you a getter. Come. Yes. Knock you down. And deal with you perpendicularly. <laughs> that is what Christians do. They, God never called them thieves. Robbers. So today, if you have been stealing, you have been robbing. Let me use the, word, the, the right word. You have been getting whatever you get. 10% you have been robbing, you better repent today. You know, this is not an exciting message. But we would want to see what triggered to the answer. This man had a problem. But there was something that triggered the miracle. People say, I, I say I, what a miracle. God, let me tell you, there is a path for you to pray. In a miracle, you, there is a path for you to pray. If you think that miracle will just happen, it will not happen. There is a verse we love very much. I know you know, you know, you know that. Eh? Verse Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. You know, 
they do this. When and my God. And my God. And that time they close their eyes. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And they say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Can you open? Can, just, just go to verse 15. Eh? Now, you Philippians, know also that I'm going to read that one so that you see. Before you come to Philippians 4, 19, what happened? Because we always like jumping like grasshoppers to the verses that... <laughs> Those verses that shoot us, you don't follow systematic whom Paul was talking about. Let me, let me read very quickly. One verse after the other, I'm going to read it. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, in the beginning, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. We want to jump there. My God. For even in the Thessalonica, you sent it once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. When you give to the, in the account of God, there is what you call a credit and debit account. I did account. In credit and debit account, every time you put money, your account is credited. In heaven, there is what you call, everybody has an account. Some of us here, our heavenly credit, credit balance is zero. Zero. And they have been living there in the Lord, but it is zero. Actually, some have even taken overdraft. <laughs> overdraft. Actually, what you are enjoying is not yours. It is maybe somebody else has prayed for you. You are living by that. Somebody is great. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. Now he is saying. He is, he is actually commending the Philippian church. I am full. Having received from Epaphroditus. The thing sent from you. A sweet smelling aroma. An acceptable sacrifice. Well pleasing to God. You know. And my God, verse 19, is not a promise. It was a prayer. <laughs> you know, you need to get a revelation. It is somebody who, who is full. Somebody who has received the gift. And now he is there. I can see what you did. You have said gift through Epaphroditus. You sent me to missions in the Lothonica. In Macedonia, you did it. Why can't I pray for you? And my, he didn't say any, you are God. Get the point. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. So don't be like grasshoppers. Read the whole thing. Get the context. <laughs> that is why you claim those things and they don't happen. And you ask, you think God is not is a liar. You have not done the elementary. That's why you need to go to elementary classes. If you are not giving your tithe, you are not giving your offering, you need the new believers class. Doesn't matter you have said how many years. You are, you, are a, you are a Christian baby. You are a Christian dwarf. You need to start there. Start with the basics. Before you come to the secondary. Before I leave there, the, the Bible is very categorical. You know, in the book of Proverbs 3 9, it says what? Honor. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thy increase. So, when you give your tithe and offering, you are not honoring the pastor. That is the, you know why you don't receive? Listen today, your motive is wrong. When you bring your check here, you think you are giving to Levi Wachira and Pastor Joan. God says, oh, it's not me. He sees the motive. He sees inside you before you give. The other thing I want you to know, God does not look at what you give, but what you, you have left with. Whatever has been left in your account, that's what he looks. He looks at. 
So you must make your motive right when you are giving. Let's move on. Uh -huh. Verse. Verse 6. I'll move very, very fast. Something else I see with this man. He was a man who was humble. Though he was a high ranking official, he humbled himself. Some of us, when we are elevated to higher office, pride come in. And you start seeing others like a over. You see them like this. You start asking them, now, who are you now? Who are you? This man was a man who was humble. He was humble. So he said this. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my, my, my roof. You remember in verse 4? What did the, the Jew say? He is worthy. Uh, you, uh, you have forgotten, eh? In verse 4, the Jews' elders gave a testimony that he is worthy receiving it. But now, instead of saying, you can even ask the, the Jews' elders. They will tell you, I am worthy. They will tell you, I am worthy. But this time, they say, he said, instead of lifting up, him up, himself up, he humbled himself. He said, Jesus, I am not worthy. That thou shouldest enter under my roof. See, somebody elevated her here, but he humbles himself. Humility is one of the avenues of you, of, of you receiving your miracle. When you humble yourself before God, and the Bible says, God resists the proud, but give grace to the humble. When you humble yourself, even in the midst of your problem, even in the midst of your calamity, even in the midst of your circumstances, that is the beginning of your solution. Amen. That is the beginning of the solution of your problem. So he humbled himself. Something else I see with this man in verse 7. Verse 7. He said, but wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come and to thee. So he never even felt worthy for him to go to Jesus himself. So that's why he had to send some people. That is humility. But he said, because I don't want you to come into my house, I have something else. I have another virtue. I have heard what you have done. I have, done, I have heard what your word has done. Yeah. You don't need to come. A man who, remember this, this is not a believer. He is a centurion from the Roman side. People we call Gentiles. But he can still say, Jesus, I still believe. Your word has power. I believe the airwaves are able to deliver your word to my hearing servant. I believe it. You don't need to come. I believe it. That one really <laughs> took Jesus now to the corner now. Like the other woman. <laughs> you remember the woman on Friday? Yeah. Now, Jesus is at the corner. And the one who is taking him, you know, remember on Friday, well, it was a Canaanite woman. He was not from the Jew. Now here is another guy from Roma. And the believers are here. And Jesus now testified. Verse 8. He said this. Another virtue. Of this man. He was a man who knew his position. He knew his identity. And he knew the, what authority can do. That's another key point. He knew who he is. He knew his opposition. And he knew what authority can do. He said, for I also a man placed under authority. Having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go. That is what I want. You know, I don't, he did not say, I compel, I, I push. He wanted to show the power of a spoken word. 
I say, go. And he go. And even my servant, and I think he was referring to the one who was sick. When I tell him, go, he goeth. When I tell him, come, he cometh. He knew the power of authority. He knew his position. Let me tell you, people of God, why things are not happening our way. Or when challenges come, when situations come, we don't know our position. We don't know that we are men and women.